the last time that I was at an event like this was at Republica, one of Europe's largest media and tech conferences. And it was pretty game-changing, because I was there to present Google Nest, a set of new products from Google, and Google's solution to the rising concern in society about what big companies and what governments were doing with their data. So we came up with some ideas. This was our, our website, Google Nest, your safe place. Um, Google Bee, for example, was one of our inventions. That's um, a personal drone. It can, it's really useful, actually. I mean, if, you want, if you, your kids are going to school and you want to check on them and make sure they get there OK, Google Bee can follow your kids for you. Or Google Bee can also just check on your partner just to make sure that they're going where they say they're going. I mean, sometimes people lie. OK? Then Google Hug. Everyone knows what it's like to have a bad day. You know, your emotions are not feeling so good, and you really need to connect with another human being. Google Hug knows exactly what's going on with you because it's monitoring your emotional well-being, and then it finds someone in your vicinity to connect you with, and then you can share a beautiful human moment. Luckily, that day in the audience, we actually had the German TV star, Jan-Josef Liefers, and he was the one who really needed a hug that day. <laughs> he was having a really tough week. <laughs> but, of course, that was not me really representing Google. Even though we got loads of media attention and uh, a huge media echo and were covered in uh, magazines like Forbes, I was there as part of a brand hack, even though I actually had a real Google business card. <laughs> I had kind of an embarrassing moment, actually, with a real Google PR person who handed me their business card, and then I realized, oh, Google business cards are actually double-sided, and mine's only one-sided. <laughs> it's like <laughs> hiding it away. Um, so what were, we, what were we doing there? What was the point? The point was to create a debate around Google's approach to user privacy, and particularly this really blurry line that um, comes when you think about innovation and then invasion when we're talking about technology. And create a debate, it really, really did. Um, the Twitter sphere went amok. Uh, people were asking, what? Why is Google creating a drone? Is that really real? Like, isn't that going a bit far? Do we really want Google involved in our data in that way? And there were polit German politicians as well who we organized to uh, tweet on our behalf and act as though it really was real, so people got even more confused. And then Google had to step in and say, oh, it's satire, it's satire. And then, um, of course, which made a beautiful moment because that begs the question, well, satire only really works when it's based on truth, right? So <clears throat> this was the first action from the Peng Collective on a digital rights topic. We've done a lot of these kinds of things. We've done things like this before. We've um, created an oil spill on the stage of Shell in order to raise awareness about what they're doing to the environment while they continue to um, greenwash. And, <laughs> um, and we, we, our work can best be described as a kind of PR laboratory, but with a really, really strong focus on ethics and aesthetics. We use our skills as artists and activists and our very vast networks and our charm a lot of the time um, to create big media spectacles in order to stimulate debate and get the world thinking in a critical way about social and political issues. And the thing with this kind of, why we think this is important and why we think it's useful for activists or anyone who wants to raise a debate about politics is that with the media, the media is in a huge platform and it's a lot more effective sometimes than just standing on the street uh, trying to demonstrate. So, for example, with Google Nest. Now, after we got a lot of media attention about you know, activists hacking Google, but then a few weeks later, even, I was put into the position of being some sort of expert on the Google topic. Um, and I was interviewed by an Associated Press journalist about just why was it that Google was lo losing support in Europe. And I was like, well, um, <laughs> I think Google is losing support because they've had a positive image for far too long. They've been really naive in their business plan. And Actually, it's really, really hard to try and stick to the motto of do no evil when your whole business model is based on guzzling up the world's data. 
So this quote um, ended up all over the world in media publications all, all over the world with my name and the Peng Collective, this activist group from Germany who knew why uh, Google was having an image problem in Europe. And then we were even cited in Bloomsburg Business uh, Week as an example of why it was that Google had lost so much support. So this is an example of just how successful it can be to use the media as an activist. And we realized at this point that we definitely had a role to play in popularizing the politics of the digital age. Why is that? Because the, the politics of the digital age are a really difficult thing to try and communicate about. We've only had, depending on where we've grown up, we've only had the internet for maybe 20 years, and for most of the time it's been all about opportunities and all the great things that the internet can do for us. So if, if you think it for, about it in, example to the, um, in comparison to the env environmental rights movement, for example, we haven't had much time to develop a critical discourse about the internet and its role in our lives. And the dominant discourse is that the internet is really sold to us as a kind of magic land, you know, where the cloud, there's a cloud looking after your data, and there's an Android who connects you with your family and friends, and an invisible person called Siri who finds your information for you. So we're the ones kind of standing in the corner, the wizards shouting, watch out, there are dragons over there. And I'm sure there are other wizards in this group, maybe, and I'm sure there are other wizards online who also want to have this critical debate about how technology affects our lives, and not just to give up control. I mean, technology is great, and it, there's lots of innovation, but we don't want to just give up control and let our freedoms and our lives be shaped by the technology around us. One way that we see technology shaping our lives in a negative way is if we look at a tool like Twitter. Twitter's really great. It's a really great tool if you're wanting to build your career, establish an identity for yourself, uh, establish establish your voice, especially if you don't live in a big city or something like that, living in a remote, loca re remote location. But the thing is, if you belong to a minority group, the chances are that you're going to get really, really harassed on Twitter. This reached such a peak in the last years that many, many women and trans people who had prominent voices on Twitter were ending up quitting. That's clearly a problem, because then the internet all of a sudden becomes dominated by a certain kind of voice, and it becomes very quickly un a very undemocratic space. So there was a lot of media around this topic l last year, and uh, there, was even a, there was even a memo leaked from Twitter by the CEO, Dirk Co Costello, saying that, or admitting that Twitter had really failed in dealing with this troll problem. So we decided to set about creating a solution ourselves. Using Twitter's amazing open access to its data stream, we were able to do a language analysis and to figure out what kinds of words and phrases were be being used to violently harass women and trans people. And we were able to figure out who were using these words. Then we mobilized all our supporters and we helped them to create fake Twitter profiles, which we then controlled with a computer script, but they all acted like real people on Twitter. They had names and they had photos and they had inspirational bylines. And we named them all troll coaches. They were part of our zero tolerance army whose job it was to head out into the Twitter sphere and spread messages of feminism and online etiquette. <laughs> so, what happened next was, one random morning, 3,000 unsuspecting Twitter users received a message from someone that they weren't friends with. And a video tutorial. That's our self-help guru giving advice in the first step of the process, which is called zero denial. Then this went on for six days over a week, 
We had six different steps helping people in the self-help journey to get over their sexist attitudes and to learn how to behave nicely online. Of course, the people who received these messages weren't so happy. <laughs> and then when you're not, you, know, you receive a message that you feel is not very nice, all of a sudden what you do is you try and block that person. But the tricky thing was that as soon as they blocked one of our troll coaches, the next message would come from another troll coach. <laughs> so this was actually a tactic that we borrowed from trolls themselves. Um, so we were effectively tro trolling the trolls. They do this, they create loads of fake accounts, which they use to mob people who they want to harass. Um, so the media really enjoyed this story because it created a new way to talk about the issue. They had been talking about it in a way that was they had been talking about it in a way that was a lot about the kind of sad stories of victims, and now all of a sudden there was a humorous way and a very technical way as well to talk about it. So we had some really great headlines. <laughs> and the people, we also got a lot of positive feedback from people who had actually been harassed, and they told us, you know, what it's like if you get harassed, or if anyone has ever experienced some kind of harassment on the street or whatever, sometimes you're not strong enough in that moment to say something. Um, and it just really helps if someone else steps in and says something. So we had our automated troll coaches who did that job for them. <clears throat> so another issue that we, we also have been grappling with um, and also is, is something to think about when we think about the kind of darker side of the internet is mass surveillance. This is, this is an issue which is also incredibly difficult to communicate with, uh, communicate about, even though it's something that affects us all. Governments having access to our emails, to our web behavior, to our phones, should be an issue for everyone who lives in a democracy that we should rise up and resist against. But for, so for some reason, the message is just not getting through. And that's because it's about technology, and it's also all secretive. It's like done by these intelligence agencies in these buildings far out from the cities. We don't even know how many people work there. So when we started thinking about this issue and how could we create a communications campaign around this issue, <clears throat> we, we decided first to just put away the technology, stop thinking about the technology and all those confusing code words that appear in the media, and focus purely on the people. We also really had to confront our own fears, because if you try and work on these issues, you get very, very paranoid very quickly. <laughs> so talking about, talking about the people, we, just, we, we came up with the question, what happens if they just quit their jobs? What happens if all the people working in surveillance just quit their job? Completely idealistic idea, I know, but actually quite a useful framing. So we came up with Intel Exit. This is a program. This was a, a, cam a communications campaign to motivate people working in the secret services to quit their jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so we teamed up with the ex-NSA employee, Thomas Drake. We made a film with him where he explains the merits of leaving your job and the ethics of leaving your job. We also created a website where um, you could go and test out. <laughs> you could go and test out your ethical standpoint and figure out if you actually were ready to leave or not. We also provided a lot of information on this website, um, providing information for people who might have questions about leaving. And here you could also generate your resignation letter. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> and then we took another step. We borrowed from the advertising world, and we created some billboards. And we went directly to the offices of the Secret Services, and we put out our billboards there. So here we are outside the GCHQ in the UK, <coughs> and in front of the Bundesnachrichtendienst in Germany. <laughs> and then we even found some of the remote locations of the NSA in Germany. This is the Dagger Complex one of the main seats of um, surveillance for Europe. And at the Clay Caserna building in Germany too. And lastly, we even found our way to the NSA office's favorite lunch spot in Fort Meade. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So we realized after this that it was actually incredibly useful to frame this topic around the people. And we got a lot of positive feedback again, we got media attention, and we got, people, we got contacted from current service, secret service agents, ex-secret service agents, and also quite a few people who just thought they were secret service agents <laughs> as well. <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> um, but we realized that we wanted, to, we wanted to extend this idea a little bit more, this idea of you know, the people behind it, and we happened to uh, get hold of a whole lot of phone numbers from the secret service offices. Uh, I can't tell you how we got those phone numbers, of course, but we created this project, Call a Spy. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> Call a Spy is exactly what it says it is. Um, it's a platform for having one-to-one -one human conversations with people working in the secret services. Um, it works in art, in art spaces and in conferences. You go up, you, just, you, you know, choose which f country you want to call, and then all of a sudden there's actually a real spy on the other end. <laughs> and they're like, how did you get this number? <laughs> and you're like, um, um, uh, hi. <laughs> and then you have to quickly think of a you know, reason for calling, and then you have to um, try and keep them on the phone. Um, and it's a, really, it's a really interesting and leveling experience for people who take part in it, because surveillance is such a scary thing, and now all of a sudden you're just talking to a human. Um, so naturally, of course, we also had to turn it into a game show um, <laughs> with live calls, and uh, we do this in theaters. We're going to be touring in Germany soon, so watch out for it. It's a lot of fun. You have contestants competing in games, trying to, <laughs> try to keep spies on the phone. Um, <laughs> So this has been a really, really interesting project for us. It's brought us into the art world a lot, which gives us a lot more freedom uh, with what we're allowed to get away with. Um, and it, it helps us reach a new audience with this topic. And lastly, it has shown us that in order to popularize these issues, in order to popularize the, the rights issues when we think about the internet, we really need to move out of our com comfort zones. Um, and Confronting, you know, in order to confront the dragons in magic land, we all need to move out of our comfort zones. It's really easy to be excited about technology and all the great things that it can do for us, but at the same time, we need to be having a critical discussion about it, and that's what our work is focusing on. If I look at a project like Google Nest, which I started with, that was two years ago, and we created Google Nest as a dystopian vision. Now, like, there are drones that follow kids to school, and there is an app called Spooner which lets you cuddle with other people. And I don't have a problem with drones. We heard about some great drones today, robotic flying creatures. No, flying robots, sorry. Flying robots, that's what they should be called. And, um, and I don't have a problem with cuddling either, but I think we do need to be thinking about these dystopias, and do we really want our dystopian visions, everyone has their own dystopian vision, and do we really want our dystopian visions to turn into reality? So, I'm just saying, have the conversation, have a critical discussion, think about the technology that you're using, think about the apps that you're using, every time you download an app and you click on that terms of, um, terms of services agreement, just think about what permissions you're giving, giving, giving away, and if you're if you're working in business or if you're a teacher, whatever it is, just bring these conversations into your workplace and try to always be thinking about the, the kind of the darker side or <laughs> the more complicated side of technology and how it is affecting our freedoms and our rights. Thank you. <laughs>